The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Edited by Frank Woodward Pine. Chapter 3. Arrival in Philadelphia. My inclinations for the sea were by this time worn out, or I might now have gratified them. But having a trade, and supposing myself a pretty good workman, I offered my service to the printer in the place, old Mr. William Bradford, who had been the first printer in Pennsylvania, but removed from thence upon the quarrel of George Keith. He could give me no employment, having little to do, and help enough already, but says he, my son at Philadelphia has lately lost his principal hand, Aquila Rose, by death. If you go thither, I believe he may employ you. Philadelphia was a hundred miles further. I set out, however, in a boat for Amboy, leaving my chest and things to follow me round by sea. In crossing the bay we met with a squall that tore our rotten sails to pieces, preventing our getting into the kill, and drove us upon Long Island. In our way, a drunken Dutchman, who was a passenger too, fell overboard. When he was sinking, I reached through the water to his shock pate and drew him up, so that we got him in again. His ducking sobered him a little, and he went to sleep, taking first out of his pocket a book, which he desired I would dry for him. It proved to be my old favorite author, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, in Dutch finally printed on good paper with copper cuts a dress better than i had ever seen it wear in its own language i have since found that it has been translated into most of the languages of europe and suppose it has been more generally read than any other book except perhaps the bible honest john was the first that i know of who mixed narration and dialogue a method of writing very engaging to the reader who in the most interesting parts finds himself, as it were, brought into the company and present at the discourse. Defoe in his Crusoe, his Maul Flanders, religious courtship, family instructor, and other pieces, has imitated it with success, and Richardson has done the same in his Pamela, etc. Kill Van Kill, the channel separating Staten Island from New Jersey on the north. Samuel Richardson, the father of the English novel, wrote Pamela, Clarissa Harlow, and The History of Sir Charles Grandison, novels published in the form of letters. When we drew near the island, we found it was at a place where there could be no landing, there being a great surf on the stony beach. So we dropped anchor and swung round towards the shore. Some people came down to the water edge and hallowed to us, as we did to them, but the wind was so high and the surf so loud that we could not hear so as to understand each other. There were canoes on the shore, and we made signs, and hallowed, that they should fetch us, but they either did not understand us, or thought it impracticable. So they went away, and night coming on, we had no remedy but to wait till the wind should abate, and, in the meantime, the boatman and I concluded to sleep, if we could and so crowded into the scuttle, with the Dutchman, who was still wet, and the spray beating over the head of our boat, leaked through to us, so that we were soon almost as wet as he. In this manner we lay all night with very little rest, but the wind abating the next day we made a shift to reach Amboy before night, having been thirty hours on the water without victuals or any drink but a bottle of filthy rum, the water we'd sailed on being salt. In the evening I found myself very feverish and went to bed, but having read somewhere that cold water drank plentifully was good for a fever, I followed the prescription, sweat plentifully most of the night, my fever left me, and in the morning, crossing the ferry, I proceeded on my journey on foot, having fifty miles to Burlington, where I was told I could find boats that would carry me the rest of the way to Philadelphia. It rained very hard that day. I was thoroughly soaked, and by noon a good deal tired, so I stopped at a poor inn, where I stayed all night, beginning now to wish that I had never left home. 
I cut so miserable a figure, too, that I found by some questions asked me I was suspected to be some runaway servant, and in danger of being taken up on that suspicion. However, I proceeded the next day, and got in the evening to an inn within eight or ten miles of Burlington, kept by one Dr. Brown. He entered into conversation with me while I took some refreshment, and, finding I had read a little, became very sociable and friendly. Our acquaintance continued as long as he lived. He had been, I imagine, an itinerant doctor, for there was no town in England, or, or country in Europe, of which he could not give a very particular account. He had some letters, and was ingenious, but much of an unbeliever, and wickedly undertook, some years after, to travesty the Bible in a doggerel verse, as Cotton had done Virgil. By this means he set many of the facts in a very ridiculous light, and might have hurt weak minds if his work had been published, but it never was. At his house I lay that night, and the next morning reached Burlington, but had the mortification to find the regular boats were gone a little before my coming, and no other expected to go before Tuesday, this being Saturday, wherefore I returned to an old woman in the town, of whom I had brought gingerbread to eat on the water, and asked her advice. She invited me to lodge at her house until a passage by water could offer, and being tired with my foot travelling, I accepted the invitation. She, understanding I was a printer, would have had me stay at that town and follow my business, being ignorant of the stock necessary to begin with. She was very hospitable, gave me a dinner of ox cheek and great good will, accepting only a pot of ale in return, and I thought myself fixed till Tuesday should come. However, walking in the evening by the side of the river, a boat came by which I found was going towards Philadelphia, with several people in her. They took me in, and as there was no wind, we rode all the way, and about midnight, not having yet seen the city, some of the company were confident we must have passed it, and would row no further. The others knew not where we were, so we were put toward the shore, got into a creek, landed near an old fence with the rails of which we made a fire, that night being cold, in October, and there we remained till daylight. Then one of the company knew the place to be Cooper's Creek a little above Philadelphia, which we saw as soon as we got out of the creek, and arrived there about eight or nine o'clock on the Sunday morning, and landed at the Market Street Wharf. I have been the most particular in this description of my journey, and shall be so if my first entry into that city, that you may in your mind compare such unlikely beginnings with the future I have since made there. I was in my working dress, my best clothes being to come round by sea. I was dirty from my journey, my pockets were stuffed out with shirts and stockings, and I knew no soul nor where to look for lodging. I was fatigued with travelling, rowing, and want of rest. I was very hungry, and my whole stock of cash consisted of a Dutch dollar and about a shilling in copper. The latter I gave the people of the boat for my passage, who at first refused it on account of my rowing, but I insisted on their taking it, a man being sometimes more generous when he has but a little money than when he has plenty, perhaps though fear of being thought of to have but little. Then I walked up the street, gazing about till near the market house I met a boy with bread. I had made many a meal on bread, and inquiring where he got it, I went immediately to the baker's he directed me to, in Second Street, and asked for biscuit, intending such as we had in Boston. But they, it seems, were not made in Philadelphia. Then I asked for a three-penny loaf, and was told they had none such. So not considering or knowing the difference of money, and the greater cheapness, nor the names of his bread, I bade him give me three-penny worth of any sort. He gave me, accordingly, three great puffy rolls. I was surprised at the quantity, but took it, and having no room in my pockets, walked off with a roll under each arm, and eating the other. Thus I made up Market Street as far as Fourth Street, passing by the door of Mr. Reed, my future wife's father. When she, standing at the door, saw me, and thought I made, as I certainly did, a most awkward, ridiculous appearance. Then I turned and went down Chestnut Street, and part of Walnut Street, eating my roll all the way, and coming round I found myself again at Market Street Wharf, near the boat I came in. 
to which i went for a draught of river water and being filled with one of my rolls gave the other two to a woman and her child that came down the river in the boat with us and were waiting to go farther thus refreshed i walked again up the street which by this time had many clean-dressed people in it and who were all walking the same way i joined them and thereby was led to the great meeting-house of the quakers near the market i sat down among them and after looking round a while and hearing nothing said being very drowsy through labour and want of rest the preceding night i fell fast asleep and continued so till the meeting broke up when one was kind enough to rouse me this was therefore the first house i was in or slept in in philadelphia walking down again toward the street and looking in the faces of people i met a young quaker man whose countenance i liked and accosted him requesting he would tell me where a stranger could get lodging we were then near the sign of the three mariners here says he is one place that entertains strangers but it is not a reputable house if thee wilt walk with me i'll show thee a better he brought me to the crooked billet in water street where i got a dinner and while i was eating it several sly questions were asked me as it seemed to be suspected from my youth and appearance that i might be some runaway after dinner my sleepiness returned and being shown to a bed i lay down without undressing and slept till six in the evening was called to supper went to bed again very early and slept sound till next morning then i made myself as tidy as i could and went to andrew bradford the printers i found in the shop the old man his father whom i had seen in new york and who travelling on horseback had got to philadelphia before me he introduced me to his son who received me civilly gave me a breakfast but told me he did not at present want a hand being lately supplied with one but there was another printer in town lately set up one keimer who perhaps might employ me if not i should be welcome to lodge at his house and he would give me a little work to do now and then till fuller business should offer the old gentleman said he would go with me to the new printer and when we found him neighbor says bradford i have brought to see you a young man of your business perhaps you may want such a one he asked me a few questions put a composing stick in my hand to see how i worked and then said he would employ me soon though he had just then nothing for me to do and taking old bradford whom he had never seen before to be one of the town's people that had a good will for him entered into a conversation on his present undertaking and prospects while bradford not discovering that he was the other printer's father on keimer's saying he expected soon to get the greatest part of the business into his own hands drew him on by artful questions and starting little doubts to explain all his views what interest he relied on and in what manner he intended to proceed i who stood by and heard all saw immediately that one of them was a crafty old sophister and the other a mere novice bradford left me with keimer who was greatly surprised when i told him who the old man was keimer's printing-house i found consisted of an old shattered press and one small worn-out font of english which he was using himself composing an elegy on aquila rose before mentioned an ingenious young man of excellent character much respected in the town clerk of the assembly and a pretty poet keimer made verses too but very indifferently he could not be said to write them for his manner was to compose them in the types directly out of his head so there being no copy but one pair of cases and the elegy likely to require all the letter no one could help him i endeavoured to put his press which he had not yet used and of which he understood nothing into order fit to be worked with and promised to come and print off his elegy as soon as he should have got it ready i returned to bradford's who gave me a little job to do for the present and there i lodged and dieted a few days after keimer sent for me to print off the elegy and now he had got another pair of cases and a pamphlet to reprint on which he set me to work these two printers i found poorly qualified for their business bradford had not been bred to it and was very illiterate and keimer though something of a scholar was a mere compositor knowing nothing of press work he had been one of the french prophets and could act their enthusiastic agitations at the time he did not profess any particular religion but something of all on occasion 
was very ignorant of the world, and had, as I afterward found, a good deal of the knave in his composition. He did not like my lodging at Bradford's while I worked with him. He had a house, indeed, but without furniture, so he could not lodge me. But he got me a lodging at Mr. Reed's before mentioned, who was the owner of this house, and my chest and clothes being come by this time, I made rather a more respectable appearance in the eyes of Miss Reed than I had done when she first happened to see me eating my roll in the street. Protestants of the south of France who became fanatical under the persecutions of Louis the Fourteenth, and though they had the gift of prophecy, as they had mottoes, no taxes, and liberty of conscience. I began to have some acquaintance among the young people of the town that were lovers of reading, with whom I spent my evenings very pleasantly, and gained money by my industry and frugality. I lived very agreeably, forgetting Boston as much as I could, and not desiring that any there should know where I resided, except my friend Collins, who was in my street, and kept it when I wrote to him. At length an incident happened that sent me back again much sooner than I had intended. I had a brother-in-law, Robert Holmes, master of a sloop that traded between Boston and Delaware. He being at Newcastle, forty miles below Philadelphia, heard thereof me and wrote me a letter, mentioning the concerns of my friends in Boston at my abrupt departure, assuring me of their good will to me, and that everything would be accommodated to my mind if I would return, to which he exhorted me very earnestly. I wrote an answer to this letter, thanked him for his advice, but stated that my reasons for quitting Boston fully and in such a light as to convince him I was not so wrong as he had apprehended. End of chapter 3